Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Missouri Trailblazers program. I'm Daniel Woodrell and Evan, Evan Connell, brought to you today by the Missouri State Museum. My name is Pam. I am the branch lead here at Holt Summit Public Library, which is a branch of the Daniel Boone Regional Library. Joining me today is Lauren, who is the Adult and Community Services Manager for Daniel Boone. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Okay, before I introduce today's presenter, I'd like to go over a few Zoom housekeeping items. On your Zoom screen, if you hover or tap, you should see a raised hand icon and a chat bubble icon. Everyone's microphones are currently muted. If you would like to ask a question at the end of the presentation, select the hand icon and Lauren will unmute you. You can also enter your questions and comments into the chat, which I will be keeping an eye on throughout the program. Today's program is being recorded and will be made available on the museum's Facebook page and the library's YouTube channel after it has been edited. If you're watching with the group, please let us know how many are watching at your location by putting it into the chat. Okay, let's get started. Today's program is a continuation of the Missouri Trailblazers series featuring trailblazers who've impacted Missouri. I would like to say a special thank you to the Missouri State Museum for their partnership in organizing these presentations. I will now turn things over to Sarah Jones, who serves as a historic site specialist for the Missouri State Museum. Sarah, would you like to say a few words about what's going on at the museum? Can you unmute? Hi, can everybody hear me? Have him mute again because it's echoey when they're both um... Okay, I'm not sure the mic is working on this laptop. I think it I'm is. Just go on for it. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to this month's um, Daniel Boone Regional Library Program with Kent Burson. Um, we are having we're having to deal with two laptops in the same room, which is an unusual condition around here. Um, I am here to introduce Kent, but I'll first let you know some things that are going on at the museum. Um, we, our next program is going to come to us after the holidays, so we're going to celebrate, um, you know, Hanukkah and Christmas and Kwanzaa and then New Year's, and then on January 4th, Amy Fluker, uh, Dr. Amy Fluker is going to join us. She's a um, Missouri resident, and she's coming to us to talk about her book on um, Missouri's commemoration of the Civil War, um, specifically going to talk to us about George Caleb Bingham's Order 11. Um, this great painting that is at the State Historical Society. So that'll be our next landing after hours, and that'll be a hybrid program here in person at the Jefferson Landing State Historic Site in Jefferson City. Um, but if you can't join us here at the Lowman Building at 100 Jefferson Street in Jeff City, then you can join us live on Facebook. Um, and it, you can join us afterwards and watch the video on Facebook. Um, but for right now, we're going to get to Kent and his wonderful presentation today. Um, Kent Burson um, was a longtime um, educator at Jefferson City Public Schools, and now he is um, in his retirement, uh, but not really uh, like resting on his laurels by any means. He's a wonderful tour guide for the Capitol and the Lowman Building. And today he's gonna to talk to us about two um, amazing uh, modern Missouri authors um, who I'm excited to hear more about because I've read their work and I think they're awesome. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kent. Hey, I'd like to start by saying thank you to the Daniel Boone Regional Library uh, for the opportunity uh, to share my enthusiasm for these two writers. And uh, I'd also like to say, I don't think they're, uh, it, I've tried not to make this a spoiler situation. So uh, go to uh, go to your public library if you are unfamiliar with these authors and, and you would like to read them, go to your library and check their books out. It's, uh, it's uh, I, I hope I encourage you uh, to do that today. And one other note, uh, our authors are um, Evan S. Canal, so you're probably looking at uh, that name and thinking that it's pronounced Connell. I, I would assume that too, but in fact, his family used a, a, a pronunciation, so it's Canal, and then Daniel Woodrow is pretty much what you would expect. Um, so to start off here, um, not advancing here, I need to shift to the next slide. 
just going to pause for a second here to get the presentation. There we go. All right, good. We're 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 ready to go. So I would point out that uh, Missouri has a very distinguished literary heritage. You're familiar with Mark Twain, also known as Samuel Clemens. Uh, he's probably the one who's most famously associated with the state due to works like Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, uh, which are set in Missouri. You're probably familiar with the poet uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, the poet Langston Hughes, the poet and writer Maya Angelou, Laura Ingalls Wilder, um, Harold Bell Wright. These are all writers that are connected to Missouri either because it's the state of their birth or somehow they, uh, some feature of Missouri is highlighted in their work. So uh, certainly these writers were ones that are trailblazers. They really pioneered uh, new paths in the realm of fiction and poetry and, and autobiography. Uh, but the main uh, concern of this presentation is to kind of hi highlight Missouri's diverse history. Um, it's a, a history that provides rich source material for um, writers. Uh, so when we think about Missouri as positioned in the middle of America, it's got two major urban centers of St. Louis and Kansas City, uh, two major river systems, the Missouri and the Mississippi River, uh, provided these avenues for expor exploration and development. So in the north part of Missouri, you have very fertile plains um, uh, that support farming and uh, the Ozarks region in the southwest part of the state is certainly noted for its unique uh, culture. It's rooted in the topography and the settlers that came from Appalachia to, to settle there. So the geographic regions of Missouri, I believe, are somehow representative of larger cultural and geographic areas forming the United States. That's you know due to its central position, it shares a lot of those similarities to, to other, other areas. Um, uh, Evan S. Connell and Daniel Woodrell, they're superb, superb observers of this really varied cultural landscape. And to a certain extent, each author is going to use personal experiences and familiar settings from Missouri to develop characters and themes that are found in their novels. Um, Connell's focus is going to be the city of his birth. That's Kansas City. And more specifically, it's going to be that affluent district uh, near the J.C. Nichols Country Club Plaza. Um, in contrast, Woodrow Country is deep in the Missouri Ozarks. It's set uh, in and around a fictional town called West Table, and that is modeled after his own hometown of West Plains, Missouri. Uh, so both authors are native Missourians, but they evoke very different aspects of our state's history and its diverse culture. Uh, so even though they're not strictly contemporaries, uh, their careers are do overlap to a certain extent. And I would like to say that both authors are, are definitely widely admired uh, for their very distinctive styles. And both are often described as writers' writers. So we're going to start with Evan S. Connell. So he, again, he was born in Kansas City in 1924. His father was a very successful physician, and his maternal grandmother, uh, grandfather rather, was a prominent uh, Jackson County judge. Uh, so the Connell, Connells raised Evan and his sister Barbara right there in that Mission Hills district uh, adjacent to the Country Club Plaza. So that's you're probably familiar with an area of upscale retail stores and affluent neighborhoods that uh, attracted uh, upper middle class families like the, the Canals. Um, he attended Dartmouth College, but he dropped out uh, to join the United States Navy on the eve of World War II. He did serve as a pilot. Uh, he was discharged from active duty at the end of the war. And that's when he uh, returned uh, to the Midwest and um, attended the University of Kansas in Lawrence, and he graduated in 1947. Um, after that, he briefly studied creative writing at Columbia University in New York. 
and then he moved to San Francisco with the intention of becoming a writer. Uh, so in doing this, he's really going to have to support himself with a variety of day jobs. So he worked as a clerk. Uh, he worked reading utility meters in San Francisco. He had a part-time job where he interviewed people who were petitioning for unemployment benefits. And the idea is these are fairly undemanding jobs that kind of allow him to focus his energy and concentration on writing. Um, uh, Cannell, he publishes several short stories in literary journals like the Paris Review throughout the early 1950s. And then in 1959, at this point, he's 35 years old, he achieved uh, national attention for the novel, Mrs. Bridge. Um, this is a novel that many uh, think is his finest achievement in, in fiction. So if you compare him to other writers of that same time period, uh, let's say John Updike or Philip Roth or John Cheever, uh, he maintains a relatively low profile after this initial success. Uh, he had no interest in moving into an academic setting or teaching. He really wasn't one to go on uh, the lecture circuit. Uh, he was really focused on his writing. He really wanted to hone his craft. Uh, doesn't mean he was a hermit. He wasn't a guy like J.D. Salinger, who was, you know, very difficult to figure out uh, where he was at. It was notoriously uh, difficult to, to discover, uh, but he was sort of um, uh, content to, to maintain a very low profile. And he's there in San Francisco. And if you're thinking about the 1950s in San Francisco, you know, there's another emergent movement there. That's uh, we probably call them the Beats or Beatniks. Uh, and he wasn't really a Beatnik. He, he was part of the that cultural scene that was blossoming there, but that wasn't really his his group uh, at the time. So in, in the novel, Mrs. Bridge, and then the companion novel, Mr. Bridge, uh, which was published in 1969, so that's 10 years after, he's really describing uh, life in the upper middle class family in the Mission Hills district of Kansas City. And that's just off the of Ward Parkway, just off of the Country Club Plaza. And both of these novels are set during the 1930s and 1940s. So the nation at that time is really uh, staggering through the Great Depression and, and, and beginning to confront uh, the eruption of World War II. And he did state that the novels are semi-autobiographical. So, you know, this setting corresponds to his own coming of age, living on 58th Terrace. You can see in the slide, I've tried to give you some sense of its proximity to uh, the plaza. Um, it, it's kind of interesting that uh, He's living near uh, lots of country clubs and churches that include the, the phrase country club in their name, as in the country club Christian church. And that is a kind of a phenomenon that provoked another famous writer from Kansas City's Calvin Trillin to comment that Kansas City is, quote, uh, the only city that would name a church country club and not be aware of the irony. Um, so the comparisons between Cannell's own family and the Bridge family are limited, yet I think they're informative. So unlike the character India Bridge, uh, Cannell's own mother, her name was Ruth, uh, she was the daughter of a judge and she was a very confident and decisive woman. Um, according to Cannell, quote, my mother's maiden name was Elton, and she went by Elton. Her name was actually Ruth Elton, but I never heard anybody call her Ruth. And that includes Cannell's own father, again, a successful physician. So he describes in uh, some interviews that he gave that is, uh, you know, his parents' relationship was unusual. He was asked whether uh, or not his parents if they ever said, I love you, and he answered, never. And then to the question, well, how did your parents talk to each other? And he answered, uh, they, they didn't. 
So Connell, Connell's father, uh, Dr. Evan uh, Shelby Connell, Connell was more closely linked to the fictional character of, of Mr. Bridge. Uh, so the conservative values of hard work, respectability, conformity, the stoicism that are shared by these two men. Uh, the description of the Connell's marriage related above, it might suggest that his mother and father were uh, incompatible or that something had really uh, fractured that relationship. <clears throat> I don't think that's the case. Uh, in a Paris Review interview that was cited above, <clears throat> uh, Connell offers this insight about his parents, quote, my mother was dying of cancer when Mrs. Bridge was published. <clears throat> My father blamed himself for her illness. They had been a, in a small car accident in Kansas City. It was just an intersection accident, and she was hit in the breast. Ten years later, that's where the cancer developed. He never said it, but he felt guilty. He thought the accident was his fault. Had he been more careful, none of this would have happened. So the interpersonal dynamic that's existing between Kennell's mother and father really appears to be one of what I would call repressed feelings and a sense of propriety rather than one of just dis dissatisfaction. So that same type of relationship exists between the fictional characters, India Bridge and Walter Bridge. <coughs> So in the novels, Mr. Bridge is clearly the dominant partner, uh, relegating Mrs. Bridge to the role of raising children and performing some light domestic duties. Uh, they're wealthy enough to employ a cook and a housekeeper. So each weekday, Mr. Bridge departs early in the morning to his downtown office, and he returns after dark. It's many times after the evening meal has been served and he's leaving Mrs. Bridge at home with the children and eventually as the children grow into young adults by herself. She is, as one reviewer describes her quote, a woman increasingly uncomfortable in the skin of her life, uh, but being too bound by convention, uh, practicality and her own fears to do too much about it. So both of these novels uh, chronicle Mrs. Bridges' attempts to escape the restraints imposed upon her by her husband, but also by society, by her own lack of confidence. Uh, but because all of her material needs are met, she really sort of retreats into this life of uh, unfulfilled hopes and yearnings. Uh, she is, as one critic, uh, Meg Wallitzer writes, a person who's moving or not uh, through life. <clears throat> to advance to, oh, there it is. There we go. So to illustrate this point, I'd like to read some, uh, uh, an excerpt from Mrs. Bridge that kind of shows the quiet desperation of her existence. And it's worth noting too, uh, that both <coughs> these novels are unconventionally structured. So instead of long chapters uh, following this uh, traditional pattern of rising action towards some type of climax and then a resolution, Cannell uh, writes very short vignettes that some are shorter than 200 words. Uh, and that's how he's chosen to convey the narrative and develop character. And he described that process in the following way, quote, uh, I had tried a traditional narrative, uh, but found that this story, as is true with most of our lives, it just has no dramatic climax. Uh, Mrs. Bridges' life was just one incident after another. There was not one great explosive event, so I had to break it down into smaller moments. Um, the excerpt that I'm going to read to you is entitled The Clock, and it describes a scene as the bridges have sort of settled into uh, their early middle age. So I'm going to read a short passage. <clears throat> she's 
She spent a great deal of time staring into space, oppressed by the sense that she was waiting. But waiting for what? She did not know. Surely someone would call. Someone must be needing her. Yet each day proceeded like the one before. Nothing intense, nothing desperate ever happened. Time did not move. The home, the city, the nation, and life itself were eternal. Uh, still, she had a foreboding that one day without warning and without pity, all the dear, important things would be destroyed. So it was that her thoughts now and then turned deviously deeper, spiraling down in search of the final recess of life more immutable than the life like she had bequeathed in the birth of her children. Now, earlier, I used this term quiet desperation. That's a Henry David uh, Thoreau allusion uh, to describe Mrs. Bridge. And I believe the passage I just read epitomizes that description. Um, despite the bleak tone of that passage, uh, Cannell demonstrates throughout the novel that Mrs. Bridge's life is really free of hardships and tragedy. Uh, her children are just the typical children of the upper middle class. They're reliant on her and then occasionally really dismissive of their mother. Uh, and her, her husband, Mr. Bridge, he loves his wife. He's absolutely committed to uh, it, her and the children. So these feelings of foreboding about the future are really rooted deeply in, in something that is hard to define. Uh, one critic, Matt Ryman, offers the following analysis of the entire Bridge family. He writes, quote, Cannell's characters, when they discover the emptiness and suffocation, fail to break free. They have trouble announcing their despair to another person. Their silence is just as much a matter of courage as it is the inability to describe their problem in the first place. So the, the themes of isolation and repression are repeated in the novel, Mr. Bridge, again, published in 1969, 10 years later. Uh, and that story covers the essentially the same time period as Mrs. Bridge, but the focus then shifts uh, to the patriarch of the family, Walter Bridge. And since I've already kind of provided a context for that setting, I'd like to jump right into uh, uh, reading you an excerpt that I think gives greater uh, depth and psychological insight into uh, Mr. Bridge. Um, so this passage actually comes from the final uh, chapter or vignette in the book. It's entitled Joy to the World. In fact, it's the very last page of the book. It's the ending of the book uh, that I'm reading you. I don't think it's giving away anything here. Uh, so at this stage, the Bridge children are grown up. They're out of the house. Uh, Walter and India follow the routines that have sort of defined their existence. Uh, the setting kind of appropriately for us right now is the Christmas season when Walter Bridge feels compelled to attend worship service as a concession to his wife and the social norms of that time period. Uh, though he's not an atheist, uh, Walter Bridge, he's got no particular religious feeling. So for him, going to church every few months is, constitutes just one of these duties that he feels like he's uh, bound to perform. It was time to sing. <clears throat> Mr. Bridge got to his feet reluctantly. He opened the book and he held it for his wife, who sang in a pure, slender tone. The congregation sang Joy to the World, and he sang a few phrases because he enjoyed the Christmas carols. Yet while he was singing, he reflected on the word joy. The archaic sound of this odd word and its meaning, he reflected that he had occasionally heard people use the word. Uh, evidently, they had experienced joy or believed they had experienced it. Uh, he asked himself if he had ever known it. And if so, he could not remember. He thought he must have known it because he understood the connotation, which would be impossible without having experienced it. 
However, if he had once known joy, it must have been a long time ago. Satisfaction, yes, and pleasure of several sorts, and pride, and possibly a feeling which might be called rejoicing after some serious worry or problem had been resolved. Uh, there were many such feelings, but none of them could be called joy. He remembered enthusiasm, hope, and a kind of jubilation or exaltation. Cheerfulness, yes, and joviality and the brief gratification of sex. Uh, gladness, too, fullness of heart, appreciation, and many other emotions. But not joy. No, that belonged to simpler minds. I think I was a little bit out of sequence there, so I've kind of shifted the slide to uh, that particular uh, quote. So these are selections from the, again, the two companion novels written by uh, Canal. They're 10 years apart, and I hope they give you some sort of appreciation for his unique style and for his ability to create characters that are realistic and psychologically complex and very much uh, products of this particular time and place. And I would admit that the tone in what I've read is undeniably bleak, uh, but I'd also like to point out that there's uh, plenty ele elements of, of humor and tenderness in both books. Uh, if the characters are repressed, it's just because they're very human. <laughs> Their foibles and weaknesses are really counterbalanced by this resolute dignity to carry on with life. So uh, taken together, the novels Mrs. Bridge and Mr. Bridge are really portraits of an upper middle class couple living in Kansas City during the early 20th century confronting or not confronting the existential crises that many American families face. So we're gonna transition here to uh, Daniel Woodrell. So Missouri author Daniel Woodrell shares with uh, Cannell this interest in writing about American families facing crises. Uh, he was born in Springfield in 1953. He grew up in West Plains, Missouri until the age of one uh, when his dad moved the family to St. Charles, Missouri to take a job. And Woodrow lived there until he was 15. And, uh, you know, Woodrow says of this time period, quote, uh, I lived there. Uh, he moved to Kansas City. I lived there for two years and I hated it. Uh, so much so that I left high school and I joined the Marines the week I turned 17. I said, I'll go to Vietnam before I spend another week in this in an expletive uh, suburb. That's how he felt about living in Kansas City. Uh, Woodrow served 22 months in the Marine Corps before being discharged. Uh, he attended Fort Hayes State University in Kansas. He graduated with an English degree. And at that stage, Woodrow follows a path that's similar to Connell's. He traveled, he worked odd jobs. He really started to consider becoming a writer as a profession. Um, that interest in being a writer, uh, you know, really led him to go to the prestigious writer's workshop at the University of Iowa. And, you know, that desire to be a writer wasn't new. According to Woodrow, quote, in the third grade, I stated publicly, that I wanted to be a writer and I meant it. And he goes on to say, what a blessing this has been to me. It gave me a direction, a uh, direction that suited to my temperament and social attitudes. Um, so by the mid 1980s, uh, Daniel Woodrow began publishing a series of detective novels that are set in a fictional bayou town of uh, St. Bruno, Louisiana. And the protagonist in these novels is a private detective named Rene Shade. And it's very much modeled after the hard-boiled detectives that are created by authors like Dashiell Hammett and uh, Raymond Chandler. <clears throat> so this early foray into uh, noir fiction led to the 1996 publication of his first novel set in the Missouri Ozarks. It's entitled give us a kiss. 
Um, in fact, Woodrow originally subtitled this novel, A Country Noir. Uh, country noir is, continues to be a term that is applied to his books, but Woodrow has stated that, quote, the noir label is a bit limiting. Hardly anyone knows what it means. And I would add, if you've read any of his books at the Ozarks, you would understand why he wants to distance himself from that country noir category. Uh, social realism or crime fiction are probably better descriptive terms uh, for the novels published since the mid 90s. And similar to Connell, the setting is vitally important to Woodrow's novels. Uh, Woodrow moved back to his hometown of West Plains in the 1990s. Uh, this location is centrally positioned in the heart of the Missouri Ozarks. Uh, it was settled by ancestors on both sides of his family. In fact, he lives just a few houses away from the house where his mother grew up. Uh, then two blocks down the street is a cemetery where uh, many of his family are buried. Uh, so Woodrow's ties to this landscape, its people and its history are strong. <clears throat> so according to Woodrow, uh, the Ozarks and many of the values of the place are anchored deep within, I'm afraid. His values like it's better to be poor than to be beholden. Uh, wealth is not the object of life in any of the good deity's eyes. Personal honor yet remains, uh, yet means a great deal. So be polite as long as you can and don't run when you can't be. Uh, another uh, person associated with uh, Missouri is a folklorist Vance Randolph. He wrote once that uh, the Ozarks is, quote, the most backward and deliberately unprogressive region in the United States. But I think Woodrow would really take issue with that assessment. Um, unquestionably, the Ozarks presented in books like Give Us a Kiss and Tomato Red and Winter's Bone is characterized by rural poverty and meth cooking and violence, but there's also beauty and a very uh, profound understanding of the terrain. So I'm gonna read a passage that's taken from uh, Give Us a Kiss. It's the protagonist speaking here. And I think he's really revealing his kind of profound appreciation uh, for that region. <clears throat> Our region, the Ozarks was carved by water. When the Ice Age shifted, the world was nothing but a flood. The runoff through the ages since has slashed valleys and ravines and dark hollows through the mountains. Caves of many sizes are abundant in the cliffs and hillsides, booger gloomy tunnels that track deep beneath the dirt crust toward the core, which is allegedly extreme in temperature. These mountains are among the oldest on the planet, worn down now to nubby, stubborn knobs. Ozark mountains seem to hunker instead of tower, and they are plenty rugged without uh, much of the majestic left in them. The hillsides and the valleys sport vast acreages of hardwood and scrub oak and pine, with small splendid creeks and rivers tracing the low spots. Here and there, chunks of land have been cleared by that type of person who has no quit in them at all. Clearing a farm in this terrain often takes generations of bickering and blood blisters to get done, and these hillbillies stuck with it. As a reward for their diligence, they got to give a go at squeezing a living from chickens and hogs and stony fields of red, feckless dirt. <clears throat> so uh, what kind of people live in that uh, literary landscape? Uh, Woodrow described them this way, <laughs> quote, the Ozarks were founded by people who basically wanted to be left alone. Uh, Woodrow's characters are not the simplistic hillbillies that are popularized in uh, Branson entertainment venues or by the Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, these people are very stubborn, resourceful, 
people that are capable of murder, but also of great sacrifice. Uh, emotion instead of calculated reasons uh, governs their choices. You know, when they're imposed upon by the modern world, they turn to petty theft and drug trafficking to survive. Uh, Doyle Redman, who's the protagonist of the book, Give Us a Kiss, expresses the looming presence of ancestral history with this reflection, quote, I oftentimes feel that my genes have me cornered. Looking at, an old, looking at old family photographs can make one nervous concerning tragic consistency, ancestral expectations, and that horrible bloodstream urge to go on and do the questionable deeds that might make those dead faces nod with grim approval. Another writer you may be familiar with, uh, Dennis Lehane, describes Woodrell's approach in the following way, quote, he writes high Greek tragedy about low people, and he never panders or looks down on the people he writes about. So this sentiment is uh, clearly evident in Woodrell's novel, Winter's Bone. That's the novel that really brought him mainstream attention, especially after uh, it was adapted into an Oscar-winning film in 2010. Um, the protagonist is a 16-year-old uh, woman named Ree Dolly, who's forced to provide for her family after her father skips bail and disappears. Um, so she's given the choice of either finding her father and turning him into the authorities uh, or having their house seized and the family gets turned out into the cold. So uh, she really undertakes this quest in deep and to find her father deep in the Ozark boonies. Uh, and I, I believe this opening passage that I'm, I'm going to read to you from the, from the beginning of the novel really captures the essence of Woodrell's Ozark characters. Ree Dolly uh, stood at break of day on her coal front steps and smelled coming flurries and saw meat. Meat hung from trees across the creek. The carcasses hung pale of flesh with a fatty gleam from low limbs of saplings in the side yards. Three halt haggard houses formed a kneeling rank on the far creek side, and each had two or more skin torsos dangling by rope from sagged limbs, venison left to the weather for two nights and three days, so the early blossoming of decay might round the flavor, sweeten that meat to the bone. Snow clouds had replaced the horizon and capped the valley darkly and chafing wind blew so the hung meat twirled from jigging branches. Ree, brunette and 16 with milk skin and abrupt green eyes stood bare armed in a fluttering yellowed dress, face to the wind, her cheeks reddening as if smacked and smacked again. She stood tall in combat boots, scarce at the waist, but plenty through the arms and shoulders, a body made for loping after needs. She smelled the frosty wet in the looming clouds, thought of her shadowed kitchen in the lean cupboard, looked to the scant wood pile, shuddered. The coming weather meant wash hung outside would freeze into planks, so she'd have to stretch clothesline across the kitchen above the wood stove and the puny stack of wood split for the pot belly would not last long enough to dry much except for mom's under things and maybe a few t-shirts for the boys. Ree knew there was no gas for the chainsaw, so she'd be swinging the axe out back while winter blew into the valley and fell around her. I think Ree Dolly is one of the most uh, vividly uh, realized uh, characters in American fiction. I think she can hold her own alongside other Missouri fictional characters like Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer or Old Matt. Uh, I would like for you to consider what I read earlier regarding Woodrell's definition of Ozark values. So wealth is not life's goal. Personal honor has value. You be polite, but you never back down. Reed Dolly embodies all of these traits, and I believe uh, they are, in fact, a really accurate representation of the values you would encounter in Ozark towns like Willow Springs or Blue Eye or Licking. 
uh, stylistically, uh, Woodrell is recognized as a truly unique voice. If you're familiar with Woodrell's books, you're going to notice traits that remind you of William Faulkner, uh, Ernest Hemingway, Flannery O'Connor, and Cormac McCarthy. And that's not to say that he's uh, derivative. Uh, his style does what Dennis Lane calls, quote, taking the regional voice of the world he writes about and turning it into poetry. It's like he reached through the hard, cold Ozarks earth and pulled that voice back out with him. Uh, so as an example of that, I would like to read a, another segment from uh, a, a different book, uh, his novel from 1998, which is called Tomato Red. <clears throat> You're no angel. You know how this stuff comes to happen. Friday is payday and it's been a gray day sogged by a slow, ugly rain and you seek company in your gloom. And since you're fresh to West Table, Missouri and a new hand at the dog food factory, your choices for company are narrow, but you find some finally in a trailer court on East Main and the co-ed circle of bums gather there, spot you a beer, then a jug of tequila starts to rotate and the rain keeps coming down with a miserable bluesy beat. And there's two girls milling about that probably can be had, but they seem to like certain things and crank is one of those certain things. And a fistful of party straws tumble from a woven handbag somebody brung and the crank gets cut into lines. And the next time you notice the times three or four Sunday morning and you ain't slept since Thursday night. And, one of the girl voices, the one you want most and ain't had yet, though her teeth are the size of shoe peg corn and look maybe like they taste sort of sour, suggests something to do. Because with Crank, you want something, anything to do. And this cajoling voice suggests we all rob this certain house on this certain street in that rich area where folks can afford to wallow in their vices and likely have a bunch of recreational dope stashed around the mansion and go into waste since an article in the scroll said the rich people whisked off to France or some such noteworthy uh, on some on some such noteworthy vacation. And that happens to be one sentence, by the way. Uh, that's Faulkner worthy for certain. Uh, Woodrell's authorial voice is it's, it's lyrical, it's authentic. I think the setting is really vividly depicted and the inciting action there really sets the mo uh, narrative in motion in such a way that it's hard to stop reading. <clears throat> so to, I, Trailblazer is a designation that would probably embarrass or anger or uh, upset both of these authors. Uh, neither one of them would qualify as publicity hounds. In fact, I think just the opposite is the case. Uh, many of you are aware of the films that are produced from their books. So uh, <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Bridge starred Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. Uh, Son of the M Morning Star was a television series. It's incidentally, probably his most commercially successful work. Uh, th those are by Evan S. Connell. And I've already mentioned the Academy Award winning Winner's Bone in connection to Daniel Woodrell, but you may also be familiar with the 1999 movie Ride with the Devil, which is uh, again set in Missouri during the Civil War based on his novel Woe to Live On. And Tomato Red has also been adapted into a film version. So it's fair to say neither author was really excited by the attention these films focused on their private lives. But I believe it is important, however, to acknowledge these Missouri authors' works as really groundbreaking. Um, they could potentially have crossed paths. I don't think that ever happened. Uh, they certainly come from different settings and different backgrounds. So Cannell is a part of Kansas City's upper middle-class society. Uh, it's country club plaza culture. It's a place where he really never uh, could quite fit in because of his dreamy and detached nature. Uh, Woodrell is an Ozarker born and bred. Uh, now he could choose to live anywhere, but where does he live? West Plains, Missouri, two blocks away from the ancestors that haunt the pages of his novels. We were, uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, two Missouri writers, uh, sort of contemporaries, 
uh, but no, not acquainted at all and from very different parts of, uh, you know, Missouri. But it's interesting that, um, you know, both of them, I feel, are, are uh, looking at American families uh, facing um, crises. Um, you know, if we wanted to compare the, the two families, you'd say that Canel's Bridge family, what do they value? They value uh, propriety. They value uh, self-discipline, uh, kind of a relentless pursuit for financial gain and social position. Uh, for Mrs. Bridge, again, her first name is India, India Bridge. So for her, a soiled hand towel in the guest bathroom is just a catastrophe. And if you think back to the passage I read uh, in relationship to Mr. Mr. Bridge, that concept of joy is just too simple an emotion for to be experienced. So you know, both of their actions are driven by this desire to insulate and secure and promote the welfare of the nuclear family. Even though that causes loneliness and isolation. Um, conversely, Woodrow's Ozark families, they know their position in the social pecking order. It's at the bottom. <laughs> so stock portfolios and social propriety account for very little. Honor, though, independence, those virtues are crucial. Uh, family, even extended family, means everything. So fathers, siblings, aunts, cousins, uh, and a sort of kin, they're subject to either protection or abandonment, uh, depending on the circumstances. So, you know, the honor of the family, whether that member is a meth cooker, a vagrant, or a teenage matriarch, is just as important to the fabric of life as the Bridges nuclear family unit. Uh, so the Bridges and the Dollies, among other Woodrow families, they're pursuing a version of the American dream. For the Bridges, that dream is really an illusion of happiness. It's attained, but it's ultimately unfulfilling and empty. Uh, for the Dollies, the American dream is really almost unattainable. It, it's blunted by this legacy of violence and excess that's deeply rooted in American history itself. Uh, so the dream of security there is just buried beneath a weight of ancestral heritage that just defies the possibility of uh, prosperity. Um, so Evan S. Connell's uh, Daniel Woodrow's writings, they really chronicle the diversity of cultures and experiences that kind of define Missouri. Uh, if you're familiar with the two writers, I hope I've given you some new insights. And if you're unfamiliar with the two writers, uh, I hope I've prompted you to, to read their novels and nonfiction writings as well. I, thanks for the opportunity uh, to share my enthusiasm to two writers that I really believe qualify as trailblazers of modern fiction. Thanks. Yay. Good job, Kent. Yeah, that was a great program. Thanks for him hanging in with us with the technical difficulties. Yeah, yeah, we, we made it through there. Uh, I also wanted to, to do a little shout out. Um, <clears throat> you're talking about The Winter's Bone. In January at the Fulton Public Library, um, on Wednesday, the 25th, one of our um, staff members is actually going to have a book discussion about the winter's bone. Oh, great. And, Excellent. And that's a good, I'm glad there's, that's kind of a good tie-in. Yeah. So please check out the um, Daniel Boone Regional website and you will, you will find out more information about that, or you can give us a call or. Uh, give them a call there. Does anyone have any questions? Lauren, do you have a question you want to ask Kent? I, so I, for one, had not heard of um, um, Canal before this presentation. And, and <clears throat> I just I don't know if what you know if the, it's just because uh, he was he's not writing contemporary right now, um, but 
uh, so this is this is fascinating. I like the comparison between the two. It does look like we've got a question in the chat, Pam. Yeah, I have I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Oh. <laughs> So I had a question for Kent. I wondered if he thought that uh, Cannell's unusual format, which a lot of authors in the time period, the late 60s, 50s and the 1960s were playing with the format of the of the novel, the narrative, um, it added or distracted from the emotional impact of it being little scenes, disconnected kind of vignettes of the family life, if that, um, added or distracted from the emotional impact of the story? Uh, I believe it adds to it. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, again, that first novel, Mrs. Bridge, is published in 1959. And as you mentioned, you know, there are writers experimenting with this, you know, the structure and, and narrative. Uh, and it kind of goes to the quote that I offered and that he in seeking to really present a very realistic uh, portrayal of this family understands that it doesn't necessarily that people's lives don't really conform to this classic formula of a of a you know things building towards a climactic event uh followed by a resolution and then an and, and ending that our lives are really uh kind of one thing after another you know we we it doesn't mean we can't have these events but that's a more uh that's a more realistic way to deal with it is just as a sequence of events and uh lauren i'm glad lauren i'm glad and you weren't familiar with evan s cannell so uh yeah i you know that i i encourage you to read it you know i know that one of the another great book by him is nonfiction. It's about George Custer. It's called Son of the Morning Star. And it's just outstanding too. And I think that just shows that he was a very accomplished writer, very comfortable uh, working in both fiction and nonfiction. So. Wonderful program today, Kent. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Kent will be back with us as well as the other Missouri State Museum staff um, here next year. We thank you all for enjoying um, joining us today. Kent, we thank you. Yeah. Is there one more question? Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see that. Um, what did you think about the relationship between India and her daughter? Do you feel we are all prisoners of our cultural construct? Um, so I didn't really, you know, concentrate on other members of, uh, the, the bridge family. They, and they are fleshed out in greater detail in both of those books. Um, uh, y yes, I, you know, the, the two daughters of the bridge family the, and the son, um, the, the son is the youngest, uh, in some sense are, feel constricted by this environment where they've been raised, where uh, the father is uh, clearly dictating, uh, making decisions in the family. Uh, and, you know, the mother is a, kind of a passive figure and they make these sort of attempts to rebel in their own way. And uh, eventually they all do break free of this sort of pattern that was set by their, their parents. You know, they, they, they reject it because I think they've grown up witnessing that their, you know, their parents were not always happy people. Um, yeah. So. Um, that was a great question. Thank you, Jane. Um, want to mention that not only in January, but Sarah, who introduced herself and Kent for us today. She'll be uh, doing the talk in February in person as well. I believe that one will be in Columbia. Um, so please stay tuned to that. We hope everyone can stay warm here in these next few days if you live in Missouri. Um, 
we want to thank Kent again for sharing your time and expertise with us. And we want to say, everyone, please enjoy your day. And if you want to catch any of the past Trailblazers event, events, they are under the Daniel Boone website there. Um, Laura, or Lauren is putting that in the chat. And also, I'm sure you can catch part of that on the Missouri State Museum. Please go visit the Missouri State Museum if you get the chance there in Jefferson City. So everyone have a great day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you all.